Joe Burnick is our guest today, our speaker. And he's going to be talking about um, a short history of Zionism. And Joe was, uh, he, is, he is the co-director of the Salt of the Earth Labor College in Tucson. And even though um, he was born in Minneapolis, he grew up in Israel and went back to Minneapolis when he was 15, but he always kept in touch with um, what was going on in the Middle East. Uh, he was educated in the Israeli school system, which included Zionist history and Bible study. So he's very well versed in the um, subject he's going to address today. Um, okay, this just covered up what I was saying. Okay, so he has, um, he, he is a graduate of Moorhead State College, now MSUM, and the University of North Dakota School of Law. He's been, act, he's been an activist in the peace, social justice, and labor movements for 56 years. So we would like to welcome Joe Burnick. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I've given the, I gave this presentation three or four years ago at Salt Earth Labor College when somebody, uh, you know, some left activists and they said, I don't understand what Zionism is. Could, could we do something that explains basically what it, what it is? And I said, I'm probably the best person to do this. And uh, 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 so, but my version today because of the nature of this organization is gonna be a little bit different than, you know, slightly different. I'm gonna emphasize uh, uh, you know, the, the Bible skeptic kinds of parts of it a little more uh, for your benefit. Uh, so what, what, what I start with is, is defining what Zionism is, what it is. And, and I can come up pretty fast with six different definitions. Uh, one was from, from a old uh, old uh, dictionary that somebody gave me when I was in high school, 963 version of Webster's. And it said that Zionism is a, a movement for the resettlement of Jews in Palestine. Uh, another definition is that it's uh, international Jewish nationalism, uh, usually includes a, a, a land, a, a country, a place. It doesn't have to, but it usually does. Uh, a, a third de definition is uh, a movement supporting the uh, Israeli Jewish state. Another definition of Zionism is Israel. Another definition is uh, more of a Marxist definition, a current Marxist definition would be the ideology of the ruling class of Israel, like, uh, like they, would, they would talk about imperialism referring to the United States. So they'd refer to Zionism as, as referring to the you know, the, the ideology of the ruling circles in Israel. Uh, another definition by now, nowadays, current days, Nazis and anti-Semites is all Jews. Zionism, in other words, they are and we're not anti-Jewish, we're anti-Zionist, that kind of thing. So there's lots of different definitions and, and they're not necessarily, you know, it's hard to say which is correct, they're all used. And, and definitions change as history changes in words like this. Uh, so uh, I, I, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the history of Zionism and then I'm gonna refer back to, to biblical basis of some of that and some of that ancient history and in between histories. So somebody criticized <laughs> My other thing, they said it seemed disjointed. It seemed to go back and forth. Well, by its very nature, it kind of has to. So, so bear with me. And if you miss something because of that, uh, when I'm done, when you're asking questions, uh, please ask me about it and, and I'll explain. Uh, the, the, the Zionist movement arose in, in Europe in the late 19th century. It, it followed the, the uh, you know the enlightenment that went on in Europe. Uh, it all started way back with the printing press because the printing press when it when it was brought to Europe and and books were being published, it, it created a lot more liter literate people. 
because when, when books had to be copied by hand and were in scrolls, very few people read them. It was mostly in Europe, it was mostly priests and, and, and monks in monasteries and stuff like that. Uh, not very many people could read, but, but everything changed and gradually changed. More people uh, got to be literate and, and, uh, uh, and it developed. And then with the development of capitalism uh, in Europe, uh, of course, capitalism replaced, I mean, it, it, it changed things to some extent by, by eliminating the feudal system where there was no separation of church and state whatsoever. And it, and it created these enlightened movements, but it also gave birth to science. Uh, uh, I remember reading a book about fossils, the guy that figured out that fossils, uh, uh, what fossils were, you know, fossils of dinosaurs and fossils of trilobites and stuff and plants of ancient times. And, and, and people believed even three, 400 years ago, the, the, the scientists believed that God just created those rocks to look that way, you know? And, and so this was, I mean, because, because historically, the Bible was is a historical document was the only book that people thought explained the history of the world, especially the early part, uh, uh, you know, the creation stories and in the very early, but also uh, uh, periods in history like 3000 years ago that there was no other written records of, especially in, in what, you know, in Palestine in the Middle East. Uh, there was no records of it. So the Bible's the only book that that covers that. And of course, if, if you're familiar with the Bible, then it all with the Old Testament, you, you'd know that the first book uh, at the beginning, it's 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 really a mythology, right? The 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 creation story and and you know and Moses and Abraham and Isaac and all that. That's a creation story and in a, in a very mythological part of the Bible. And and it becomes less so is it progresses and at some points it has a lot of uh, historical reality because the people that were writing it are actually experienced some of these events. If you look at Chronicles and it says, King so-and-so will rule from this year to this year and his wife's name was this and he had four sons. And you know, it's, it's, it's probably pretty accurate in some places, later, later books. Of course, there were the miracles, just like our own history of the United States, which isn't that old, has, we have our own mythology about uh, George Washington cutting down the cherry tree and all kinds of mythologies, but but that has very deep mythologies. So so breaking, you know. Uh, uh, so what what you have in Eastern, what you had in Europe was this rise of capitalism, the rise of the kind of imperialism that meant the the dividing up of Africa. You know, before before the Civil War, ours of Civil War. It was like Portugal had the coast of Africa from here to here, and and then France had it from there to the next river, and then you know from that river to that river was British. You know they they just had places on the coast. They didn't have the interior of Africa, but 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 after about 1870, they started dividing up Africa, and it and it involved and and grabbing Asia and everything because of the developments and. In technology, where the the Bessemer steel process and uh, aluminum and all the industries, they all of a sudden needed minerals, oil to, to run locomotives and and all that. So all of a sudden, they divide up these countries, and, and a real establishment, I mean, a real colonial establishment, has developed uh, a colonial system, and and and, uh, and 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 nationalism, nationalism ar arose because the printing press gave rise to literature not in Latin, but in, in, in your native language in French and German and, 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 and you know, so it, it gave rise to nationality. In Europe, a nationality is, is basically based on the language people spoke. Uh, and, and in Eastern Europe, there was a huge Jewish population in Eastern Europe, uh, probably 85% of all Jews in the world lived in, 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 in at what at one time had been the, the, the widest borders of the of the Polish Empire, the Polish Empire of the 16th century, uh, uh, later the Polish Lithuanian Empire, when it, the biggest expansion it has, that's where most Jews lived at that time. And they were mostly, the, the growth in the Jewish population there was basically a natural birth, you know, expansion. 
because the the because of the the you know the the good conditions that Jews lived under. They were recruited by Poland, and 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 that growth, and and the language they had was Yiddish, Jewish. Yiddish just means Jewish, and they and they spoke a language. So when nationalism arose in Europe, uh, and we're talking about you know France, Spain, Portugal, England, Denmark. Sweden, you know, maybe 10 countries at the most. The rest were all colonies. You know, we're not, you know, we're not, we're, the rest were not independent. Poland, Romania, Finland wasn't. Norway was a colony of Denmark. Ireland was a colony of the British. Uh, uh, you know, all of Eastern Europe, you know, uh, former Yugoslavia, etc. cetera. But, but they were starting to fight for independence. Germany and Italy were a bunch of small states. They were uniting just in the middle of the, of the 19th century. And, and, and so, a Jew, so Jewish nationalism kind of emerged in that milieu, right, it, 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 in Europe. Uh, uh, but the, the thing that corresponded with it was that, that, the, that Germany was kind of the center of science in the 19th century, the scholars. And the scholars were still, had their heads stuck in the Bible to a large extent. And, and uh, uh, so they, you know, the scientists were trying to figure out race. So, but they were also trying to justify colonialism. And the way you justified colonialism was that Arab people and African people were, were inferior. They weren't full human beings, they were inferior. And, and that justified colonialism because an enlightened Europe was gonna uh, educate them and bring them up uh, uh, into the modern world and everything. And, and and so the anti-Semitism, you know, therefore Jews were, were Semites. Uh, uh, and therefore, the, like, like the Arabs, you know, they, they had already determined that Arab people were, were inferior. So if Jews are Semites, they're also inferior. That's where the anti-Semitism comes from. Uh, uh, they, they were likened to the Arabs that, that they knew were inferior, right? Uh, and, and it came out of that. And in reaction to the anti-Semitism and as also in reaction to to nationalism in Europe, and and the, 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 this Zionist movement arose. It started with with uh, people writing in Hebrew, uh, and and uh, and then it expanded into, and in, you know, writing in Hebrew. It wasn't exactly Zionism yet. You know, Hebrew hadn't been spoken since about five six hundred six hundred 650 something BC. Hebrew was not a spoken language from about 650 BC to about 1900. It was not a spoken, it was just something you used in, in, in prayers and, and et cetera, like, like Latin was used in, in churches in Europe. And, and they, but so they were going back to, to their roots, they thought, uh, big, and, and uh, they were writing in Hebrew, but there was also a, a enlightenment. Uh, 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 they called it Haskalah, Hebrew word among Jews in Yiddish, and a rich Yiddish literature developed. If you've heard of Shalom Aleichem, the writer, he's a uh, fiddler on the roof. That story, the writer, he was a Mark Twain of of Jews, uh, and and that whole Jewish culture mushroomed, and and that that so we, so out of that grew a movement of Jews that said, we are a nationality, we are uh, a people and we should have a, a, a land of our own, et cetera. It wasn't decided on Palestine originally, even the founder of Zionism, Theodor Herzl uh, suggested maybe Uganda. You know, nobody lives in Uganda, right? It's empty, even though it's the most densely populated place in Africa that, well, south of the Sahara, because I'm sure Egypt, the Nile Valley was more, but, but it, you know, it's, it's great agriculture land and it was very densely populated, but, but they, you know, so the horror of that would have been really bad, but, the, it, but anyway, this Jewish, this Zionist movement emerged and, and it, it did get real big. It kind of slowly grew. And as a reaction to anti-Semitism, it, it, it experimented growth. In the United States, it, it often paralleled left-wing movements, uh, labor Zionism, for instance, labor Zionist, various social labor movements that were, that were on the left. 
and 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 it wasn't a particularly reactionary movement, except in the sense that nationalism often can be, uh, not always, uh, but it can often be, and 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 that that went on until the Second World War and the Holocaust, and and of course that changed everything because during the Holocaust, uh, uh, you can imagine the horror of of Jews worrying about the Nazi army reaching where they were living or, or uh, in my family in Eastern Europe, my father was born in Eastern Europe and, and people always ask me where, well, it's on the, near the border of Lithuania, Belarus and Poland today in that area it was very heavily Jewish area. And, and most of the family immigrated to, to Argentina or the United States, but of, of, we have no, survivors the holocaust nobody no relatives that survived the holocaust that stayed behind not at all and 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 the horror of that it drove a lot of jews to saying uh, uh we have to have our own place we have to defend ourselves like any other country never again and it, it brought a lot of sympathy for jews and it it led for the it led to the zionist movement becoming uh, uh very acceptable and and respectable and and sympathy from from around the world and 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 giving a blind eye to the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians in 1948, and it was an ethnic cleansing, uh, uh, and and you know, but it was a period of of movements, you know, like in in here in this country, we we rounded up all the Japanese Americans and put them in concentration camps. The Soviets uh, uh, rounded up the Tatars. At, and moved the whole Tatar population out of the Crimea and other places because they thought they would be, uh, the Germans were making uh, overtures to them. So they wanted to protect themselves. After the war, uh, uh, 2 million Germans were, were moved out of Poland and the Polish border was moved in that direction towards, towards the West. 2 million people were moved over. So, so these things were kind of accept, accepted uh, uh, at that time in the late forties. Because, because there was a recent history of all these movements, but that's history. Uh, I'll go back to that, okay? Now I wanna go back to, to some of the biblical things. Part, part, of the, part of the idea that Jews are a nation is, is based on that 19th century science. And these German scientists accepted the, the, the biblical thing. If you read the Old Testament, it, it uh, uh, in, in Exodus, the first book, Exodus, it talks about uh, the, the begets. It said so-and-so begets, so-and-so, so-and-so begets, so-and-so. The, the idea was that, that, uh, that, okay, so, you know, we're then Ismael, Abraham's second son, Ismael. He's the father of all the Arabs. Uh, 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 Esau, Jacob's twin brother, the one that was cheated out of his, majority, you know, he, he became the father of all the Edomites. Uh, so-and-so, Lots, you know, Lots from Sodom and Gomorrah, the survivor, his, his two grandsons, one's the, the, became the founder of this, the father of all the Moabites and another one of all the Ammonites. Uh, the, the belief, because these people were herders and dealt with animals and stuff, they saw it as a very racial thing. And they, they believed that, that every ethnic group that spoke a particular language we're, we're all descendants and they were all kind of related. Uh, and, and, and I mean, this whole idea that now we recognize is, is completely false. Uh, 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 in, the, in the case of the French, you know, I mean, every German tribe came through that the Celts and the Romans conquered and the Phoenicians were there and, and, and the Huns and the, you know, everybody came through Europe. It was a mixture. Somebody did DNA tests, the British Isles in all the British Isles from the Shetland Islands to Ireland, to England, Scotland, there's no difference in the DNA. It's a mixture, very similar mixture all over. And, and that's the real reality of much of the world that, 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 that thing. So, so this idea that today's Jews, see it's based, Zionism is based on the idea that all Jews are descendant from, from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that they're all the descendants. And, and, and that's not based on any evidence. The only evidence is that 
according to the book of Genesis, God promised Abraham that, that his descendants would be like numerous, like the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the beach and they'd all be his descendants. A promise before he had a son, okay, by a hundred year old wife. You know, that's less believable than the Christian virgin birth, right? That she gave birth at a hundred. Uh, uh, and and it, it's all based on these on, on, on that one myth, if you call that even evidence. And, and then the Bible goes into story after story. His own son married a non-Jew, non a non-descendant, and his grandsons. And, 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 and when they, uh, uh, the book of Joshua, when they conquer Canaan, uh, you know, oh, when they leave Egypt, even some, all these other Gentile groups went out with them that had grievances. They all joined them and went with them. And when they conquered, they, they, they you know, one, one village tr tricked them and they, they brought them into themselves. And there's just example after example in the, in the biblical record of, of, of mixing with, with other peoples in, 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 in the area where they lived. And then there's examples of, 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 and then there's a history, the, when history begins, you, if you've heard of Josephus, in Hebrew, it's Yosef uh, ben Matityahu, ben Matthias, the, the, he wrote in Latin, and he was a, the, the Jewish uh, uh, noble from, that, that had been brought as a prisoner to Rome, but he, he, uh, he, he wrote, he wrote the history of the Jews. So a lot of the history is, is the history of, of the period up to his period, which, you know, during the Greek, uh, uh, after Alexander the Great, especially, it's the only history really uh, of the, the Greek period, the 10 generations of, uh, from, from Alexander the Great to, to Rome. And, and he details how the small number of Jews that came back from, from exile, uh, the Bible says that 10 tribes of Israel were exiled and never heard again. And, and the other two were exiled to Babylonia and they, them being Judah, hence the word Jew, and Benjamin, which was the smallest, the largest and the smallest. Uh, the Benjamin evidently got, if it ever existed, was, was assimilated into the Judeans. But it was a small group of people, 20,000. And, and Josephus talks about how the Edomites were converted by sword to Judaism. And then the rest of the Palestinian area was converted to Galilee and place after place. And the people were converted to Judaism by sword. These were all converts, and 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 uh, and then later in Roman times, proselytizing. You know how Baptist and and some of these denominations, uh, uh, what they do is they a pastor uh, starts preaching, and and I remember working at a school, and they would rent a room for Sundays, and a Baptist preacher, and he would start preaching, and when he got enough people, he would raise money and build a church and stop renting there. Well. After the temple was destroyed, there was a rabbi system and, and people preached and there was all kinds of Judaism. It was the only monotheistic religion and people liked the concept of a monotheistic religion and it spread. Uh, some writers predict, uh, speculate that 10% of the whole Roman empire, you're talking Britain, Romania, Hung today's Hungary, Italy, the whole North Africa, you know, a huge area uh, 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 and up to 25% in the Eastern Mediterranean became Jewish. I don't know if that's true, but they became Jewish. And then Christianity arose within that. So there was a huge amount of conversions. And we have records of this. We don't have records of, of the other, but we have lots of records of conversions. And, 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 uh, but it's, a you know, you read almost any subject nowadays, any books, I'm, I'm an avid history reader, and I read history of, of all kinds of countries. And when Jews are mentioned, all the writers still assume that all Jews are descendant of the ancient Israelites. But there's no evidence of that. But yet that's an assumption everybody have. Most of you probably have that assumption. And, and it's not true. And even, even the DNA uh, uh, stuff, they do, they do DNA research on, on, uh, on North Africa, North, you know, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and, and they say, the, the Jews of those countries are, are most closely related to the Palestinian people, you know, the Palestinian peasants, because the assumption is that, that the Palestinian peasants probably are 
ancient Israelites had converted to Christianity and then converted to Islam and and but stayed on the land. So so there's that, you know. But I grew up in northern Israel that was pretty much Phoenician territory. So these scientists do DNA, but they don't know history. They never heard of Carthage. They never heard of Hannibal and his elephants. They didn't know that that area was heavily settled by Phoenicians from Palestine and Lebanon. So of course their DNA would be similar. It had nothing to do with Jews. You know, it was, it was so, you know, the, the scientists, you know, it's, it's a really denied kind of thing. And, and, uh, and, you know, and there's, you know, and in North Africa, there were Berber, the Berbers are the, the pre-Arab population of, of North Africa. And, and, and there was Berber kingdoms, Jewish kingdoms. There was a big Jewish kingdom in Yemen. And, and when you get a Jewish kingdom ruled by a Jewish king and nobility, there's a lot of conversions and stuff. So the Yemeni Jews are, are probably mostly descendants of, of those people that converted at that time. There, there was a Jewish kingdom in, in Mesopotamia. Uh, there was Jewish kingdoms in Syria. There was uh, that kind of thing in, in, in early thing. Now, now, of course, what happened uh, when Constantine made Christianity the the the, the state religion of the Roman Empire, uh, uh, then he, he was suppressing other religions, right? He was suppressing paganism, but he was also wanted to suppress Judaism and other religions. And, and to protect themselves, the rabbis uh, issued, uh, I call it a fatwa, but that's an Islamic term, but they, they, they put out edicts against proselytizing and converting people to, to, to Judaism and, and and that's where that came from, you know, that Jews are no longer proselytized because that's the only way they could be accepted is by agreeing to stop proselytizing. The same thing happened in Islamic uh, countries later, uh, uh, you know, because uh, any Christian or Islamic country may or may not at any given time uh, uh, be tolerant of other religions, but they also went to periods where they were not tolerant. And, and at those times, so these, these edicts came out and, and Jewish people eventually uh, 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 stopped proselytizing. That was the basis of being accepted or tolerated and, and et cetera. But that was not the early period. The early period, th there was no real uh, Jewish doctrine anyway. It was, it, it was just a growth and spread of Judaism. And, and when, when Paul, uh, the apostle, you know, when he opened Judaism to, to Gentiles and brought in other people, uh, that also probably uh, uh, lessened the conversion to Judaism because he made it, he made it a lot simpler to be a, to be a monotheist uh, because it, it uh, uh, he, you know, he, he no longer made diet restrictions, circumcision, all kinds of restrictions that Jews had. He made, he made it much easier. So there were a lot of conversions, maybe promising the afterlife, and and, and you know it was very easy. Accept Christ, and you get the afterlife. Uh, uh, with with you know, uh, I don't know what the Jewish idea. You know, the, the biblical times they didn't have the concept of heaven or hell. Their concept of afterlife was more like the Greek Hades. You know, like like something underground where where there were shades. There's, there's a, something in books in Samuel in the Old Testament describing. Uh, I think. You know, King Saul went down there, or or the brought up the witch of Endor brought up, uh, uh, yeah. Why did you disturb me? You know that kind of thing, uh, and and so so a lot of those, uh, you know, the the Jewish, and Muslim, and Christian religions kind of uh, grew up together. You know, they the philosophy during the during the the, the this last this last millennium that just got over. Uh, kind of developed the notions of heaven and hell and all these things together kind of uh, um, it kind of developed together very similar views on that uh, but anyway I'm, I'm, I'm blitzing so so uh, uh, so you know so on the other hand you take somebody like my father who who grew up when he came at age 14 to the United States he only spoke Yiddish Jewish and and he only spoke Jewish. He he that was his language. There was several million Jews living in that area. He came in 1921, and and uh, uh, so he was a Jew. He wasn't Polish. He wasn't Russian. 
a Lithuanian, he was a Jew. He, that was his language and, and Jewish culture and everything. So, so, uh, but, so it's fine. I mean, they deserve, I guess, in theory, the Jews in, in Europe the, that spoke Jewish, they were a nationality group, deserve recognition as any other nationality group, as, as Lithuanians, as Poles, as Russians, Belarusians, whatever. But, but the, 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 the jump, the, the leap was to say that, that the Polish Jew that spoke Yiddish was the same nationality as the Ethiopian Jew who spoke Amharic or the Indian Jew that spoke Hindi or, or the, the other center, scholarly center in the Middle Ages, it was in Uzbekistan, what's now Uzbekistan. And they had their own Jewish language that was a Turkish kind of version of, of Judaism. And, and etc. you know, there was different Jewish languages or, or they spoke the language that other religious groups spoke in their, in their countries. So this notion, but Zionism changed that. And, and Zionism said, all the Jews are descendant of Abraham. They're all blood. They're all the same thing based on myth. Based, and if, if you're interested in following this more, there's, there, I, I was telling an Israeli friend about what I, what I said in the presentation. And he said, there's a book about that recently published by a professor from Tel Aviv University. And it's called The Myth of the Jewish People. If you're interested, The Myth of the Jewish People, it's by a, a man named uh, uh, Shlomo Sand, like sand is in beach. Uh, Shlomo Sand, I, I think I got it from Tucson Community College Library actually. Uh, he also wrote one about the, the, the scripture, about the myth of the land of Israel. Uh, of that concept. It's a little harder to read if you're not familiar with uh, scriptures and that some, but, but it, the, the myth of the Jewish people is very good, except for the chapter about the Khazars, uh, if any of you ever heard of the Khazars. So, so anyway, now I'm going to go back to Second World War period. After the Second World War, uh, uh, what happened is that, that uh, in, in, the, in the Soviet Union, most of Jews that, that are, you know, Holocaust survivors, when you hear of Holocaust survivors, that doesn't mean death camp survivor, concentration camp survivor. That usually means somebody that ran, that ran from the Nazis. We had a, a woman in our neighborhood in Israel that was 16 and she belonged to, to the revisionist, the Jewish fascist organizations. The, 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 the Jewish people like all other nationalities had a fascist organization in Europe. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, Bibi Netanyahu, the current prime minister of Israel, his father was the, uh, 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 what do you call it? The, 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 the guy responsible for relationships with them, with the Nazi party. They encouraged the Nazis because they were hoping they would drive the Jews out to go to Palestine. But, the, but she was in the youth organization. And when the, when the Nazis marched into Poland, she was in the area that the Russians occupied, that the Soviets, and they ran to the Nazis. They were so anti-communist, they ran to the Nazis. She was the only one in the group that survived because she was young and healthy and she worked as a slave camp and she somehow survived. But most of the people that survived, they just ran and the Soviets just put them on trains and sent them to, into, into Russia, into Siberia to, to protect them. And after the war, uh, uh, of course, the ones that were young often were, went into the, the, the Soviet army, the Red Army and, and fought the Nazis. But, but the ones that survived, the, the Soviets gave them five years to choose in 1946, to choose whether they wanted to stay and become Soviet citizens or to leave. I think most of them probably wanted to go back to Hungary and Romania and Poland and see if any family members survived and, and went back and, and uh, when the, so when the five years were up in 1951, there was a huge immigration to, to Israel uh, uh, from those countries, from, from my neighborhood that I grew up in, in was 90% was were Poles, Hungarians, Romanians, Iraqis and Egyptians. The, the Iraqis and Egyptians were, uh, the, the countries like Iraq and Egypt, uh, all the Arab countries basically were, were ruled by reactionary right-wing kings, kind of like, you know, mafia, like the mafia that runs Saudi Arabia that named the country after their Saudi family. They're, they were just mafia people that took over the country. They made themselves kings and they, and they were, they weren't, they had no principles. And, and as demagogues, they, they 
uh, when Israel became independent and, 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 and cleansed the Palestinians, they went on the radio and they preached anti-Jewish things and anti-Israel things and, and, and incited anti-Jewish riots. But also the, the Zionist movement had an organization in, in some of these countries and, and some of them were, were, were military militants and, and Ben Gurion later, you know, actually ordered them to, to bomb synagogues in Baghdad, Iraq, and in Alexandria and Cairo to scare the Jews into leaving. He actually, Ben Gurion actually had to resign for a couple of years because of the scandal of doing that. But, but those were the people that came in 951. The Jewish population tripled. The population of Israel basically tripled that year. That was a year we got there. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, so those were the people that, you know, and it, because the, the, the Jews that came to the United States and France and England and the Western countries, they didn't want to leave. The, the living conditions were much better than living in Israel. When you came to Israel, you were living in a tent. Uh, uh, food was, was rationed. 70% uh, uh, of their exports were oranges and another 15% were other citrus fruit. They had very little industry. Uh, uh, it was very, very poor. So, so they were mostly people that came with nothing and, and, and the, the, they were melded into, you know, uh, Yiddish was suppressed in Israel uh, uh, and they were trying to uh, forge a new country and a new language and a new ideology and everything to, as a national ideology. So, so it became a very Zionist thing. So in Israel, Zionism is that in America, uh, a Jewish person in America that says our Zionist usually just means that they support a, a Jewish state in Israel. And, and whenever they poll American Jews, you know, when do you support Israel? If it was when a peace, when it was a war, when Israel got in a war, which they often did, and they polled Jews, do you support Israel? And the majority would say yes, but it would be 55%. But then when they signed the peace treaty, do you support Israel? All of a sudden it's 75%. Uh, because American Jews really don't care about the borders. They like the idea that there's a Jewish state, they kind of sympathize with it, but they're not hung up on the borders. In Israel, Zionism developed into kind of a empire thing to, to, to you know, after all, God didn't, God promised uh, that, that, you know, a big empire, you know, from the Euphrates to the Nile, you know, so, uh, you know, so you get into this whole the land becomes more important than than the people. You know, it's it's okay to sacrifice ten thousand Jews in a war if you conquer some more land. I mean, it's all it's all gotten in this. You know, the, the education system over in Israel is 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 put a real biblical mentality. I mean, Old Testament kind of mentality of 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 in 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 in, in people's heads. You know, like like when Joshua was ordered to to capture a town and kill every living thing. And he went in and they killed all the men, but they but they they kept the women and girls and and the livestock and God punished them for that because they were supposed to kill everybody. But that whole mentality of, of killing everybody and, and that mentality still exists in the right wing in Israel. I'm, I'm not saying that everybody believes that, but but that's that's part of the the whole political feature and, and people are leaving uh, because of that. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, the, the, so Israel's really, you know, and then the other thing that happened in Israel was that, that uh, uh, Israel was very, originally the found, founding of the state of Israel was supported by the Soviet Union and the United States and the United Nations. Uh, the Soviets always, uh, looked at the Jews as a national group because the, the Jews that they were familiar with all spoke Jewish and, and they thought of them as a national group. And they probably also, you know, were educated in biblical studies and probably thought of it that way. And, and uh, so, so, uh, so anyway, so, uh, what, so after the war, the Marshall Plan, when the United States put the Marshall Plan to to be, rebuild Western Europe, uh, for instance, they they gave Marshall Plan money to West Germany, and West Germany paid reparations to the Jewish state for the crimes of the Nazis, and and like they'd build a destroyer for the Israeli Navy, 
they take the Marshall money and they give it. And so uh, uh, they were fed with American wheat that was either free or, or loan that never got paid back. They were given wheat, they were given uh, all kinds of aid from the United States, but also from the American people in, in Jewish Americans and in the United States, Canada, Australia, South Africa, where they were doing well. Uh, so, so the Israelis, even though they, they made independence with Soviet bloc weapons, I, I had military training in Israel in high school and we used Czech, Czech guns uh, in our training that were used in that war. They, they, they decided to go with the West instead of the East for various reasons. And, and a lot of it had to do with the aid. The Soviet Union and the Eastern countries, they were devastated by the war. They were in no position to pump in a lot of money to Israel. So, so, so that's what happened. So Israel ended up uh, going that way. Uh, and I'm looking at my notes here. Do I have, uh, anyway, I I'm, I'm probably took a lot of time, but I zipped through it. And I, it still took time. So just a very general thing and I'd rather go to questions, <laughs> comments. Is somebody Let's gonna recognize you. people? Uh, yeah, I did see at least one question in the chat. Let me uh, make that. Could you read them to me, please? Yes, I will, one second. Uh, okay, Howard had asked something um, and Avery replied with uh, Wikipedia information. Uh, Howard had asked if Yiddish is the same as German, um, except written uh, with the Hebrew consonants and, but none of the Hebrew vowel markings. Um, and he asked, is that correct? Uh, Avery replied, uh, but what, what's your uh, response to that? Okay, my, my mother who was not Jewish uh, uh, learned, we learned Yiddish in Israel because that's the, because we were living with immigrants who spoke Yiddish and that's the only way she could go to the grocery store and shop. And, and she had had some German in, in, uh, in college, I think. So she, she knew a little German and she learned Yiddish. And my parents would have an argument once a year uh, about whether Yiddish was a language or a, or a dialect of German. Uh, it's, it's linguists, all linguists consider it a language. Uh, uh, it's not just German with Hebrew writing. I mean, the concept of a alphabet, you know, you, if you've ever heard of Ladino, which is a Jewish Spanish that descendants of the Jews of Spain still speak in many countries. Uh, my friend Elisa that's on this call, she, she's a Turkish Jew and she speaks that. They, I, so I had a friend from Morocco and I said, did, did the Jew, did they use the Hebrew alphabet in, 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 in Morocco? And she laughed at me and she says the concept that, that a particular alphabet belongs to a language is a very modern concept. He says that the, the Jews in Morocco not only wrote Ladino in, in Hebrew, they, they wrote the Arabic in Hebrew letters because they only knew one. Uh, but, but, uh, but for instance, uh, in English, you, you uh, uh, I mean, Yiddish is more like English than it is like in some ways. The, the structure of sentences is not the same in German. In German, the verb goes at the end, and in 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 Hebrew and Yiddish, it's it's more like Hebrew. You know, the boy fed the dog. You know, noun, verb, a subject, verb, object. You know, German's not like that. The the a lot of the words, like the words for common household things, like like the cow the family owned, the water. Uh, uh, you know, tables, uh, uh, common like household things and everything are Germ German, but there's also Hebrew words, especially that have to do with Jewish rituals, you know, the Sabbath and, and stuff like that. But then a lot of other words like, like shiko, shiko means drunk, that's a Hebrew word, or mamzer, mamzer is, uh, it means bastard. Both the, both the words, the meanings that we have in English, and that's a Hebrew word. And so a lot of, a lot of words are like, I think it's a Hebrew word. Uh, uh, maybe not. Maybe the he modern Hebrew adopted it from from Yiddish. But but there's all kinds of words like that 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 are Hebrew words that are in, in Yiddish. But it's definitely a a, 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 a different language, a, a separate language. It has its own literature, uh, a very rich literature, and, and everything else. Yes. 
that's my answer to that. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other new ones in the in the chat. Uh, um, I, I had a question in there. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I, I was. Um, it was interesting when you were talking about the di different ancestries of the of the Jewish people in Europe, and I, I. A few years ago, my sister-in-law had her DNA done with Ancestry.com, and it came back saying 100% European Jew. A and I thought, what does that mean? Uh, you know, because I, I just, I didn't know um, some of the background you just gave. Uh, you know, how does that relate to other European DNA, and how does that, or, or does it relate to Israeli DNA? Or, or you know, what, what, what would that mean to be 100% European Jew? Uh I don't know, but I, I read the I read one of these DNA scientists books, and he did he did three one with Ancestry.com and two others, and they all gave him different answers. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the DNA of, of Jews seems to indicate the DNA stuff is real inaccurate. Okay, I mean it's 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 at pioneering stages and everything, but the the indication seems to be that that. European Jews, I mean, I think that word was Ashkenazi Jews, it was probably used. And yeah. Ashkenazi means Germanic, Yiddish speaking, or German speaking, you know. Uh, and and the indicates that they seem to be descendants of people that lived in Northern Italy, Greece, Syria, and Turkey. People that lived immediately south of them, that moved up. Uh, many of them were probably already practicing Judaism uh, they might have been, you know, and they were practicing the religion and, and they moved north first and in, more into Germany and Belgium and those areas, but then eventually they were recruited by the Poles and they moved east. So that seems to be the, the trajectory of the, of the Jewish movement. And, but it depends how many generations you go back, right? If you went back 5,000 years, there weren't any Jews, right? So they're going back to 150 years ago maybe it fits a pattern of, of Ashkenazi Jews in, in, in Poland or Belarus or something. It could mean that. Uh, certainly, uh, my, my, I have two sisters that are archaeologists and they did some work on trying to figure out our ancestry, our Jewish side. And, 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 and they, go, they even found census forms, uh, census in Tsarist Russia, and they go back to early 19th century and, and everybody seems to be Jewish, you know, Jewish names. And, you know, and, and uh, um, so, you know, there was, a, there was a certain coherent Jewish community. So if you go back slightly, yes, but that doesn't mean that, that you know, uh, I mean, if they're, if they're Jews, if they're Israelites, they wouldn't have been in Europe uh, uh, 2000 years ago. So I don't know what it means to say that they're European Jews <laughs> means what, of what period? Right, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've, I've noticed on the the in ancestry information that you get from DNA sites, they, they'll change it. They'll, they'll uh, um, you know, they'll send you updates on it because they get they learn new things from it, or else they have more people to base their their um, conclusions on that kind of thing. Uh, and, but I, I just thought it was curious that that there was there was a category called European Jew. Yeah, and, and, and ancestry can't tell you what religion your great grandmother practiced. Right. Yeah. What about yeah. Sephardic Jews? Where are they from? I missed the beginning also. I, I didn't talk about Sephardic Jews, but because I was talking about the rise of Zionism in Europe, but, but I can answer that. Usually these discussions get more political, current politics when you go into question and answers too, and that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Sephardic means Spanish. Mm -hmm. it's 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 the hebrew word for spanish okay and it literally means spanish and and so it means two things it means one it means the 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 jews that were kicked out of spain that became refugees at the time of the inquisition that started in 19, in 1492 the same year that columbus sailed the ocean blue right but it was the reason for the expulsion of the jews and of columbus was that that was a year that the christians consolidated control of the peninsula of Spain. So things changed. And, and, and I suppose the persecution wasn't just the Jews, it was also the Muslims. But the Sephardi 
Jews are the descendants of those Jews that left Spain and they settled around the Mediterranean. The Turkish Jews I knew were all uh, uh, spoke Spanish at home. Uh, a lot of the Jews in Alexandria and Egypt, the, the, the Ottoman Empire really recruited Jews in Spain because Spain was, was a scientific center. You know, when they talk about the Middle Ages and the backwardness of Europe, they're talking about Christian Europe. Muslim Spain was, was one of the centers of, of, of culture and science and everything. That's where algebra was, de you know, developed and all that. And, and, and so they were recruited by, by the Ottomans and, and they wanted the, the technology and the knowledge and, and that of the Jews that had it. So one thing it means those people, their descendants uh, in Greece and Turkey and in Egypt and Libya, not so much Libya, but Tunisia, Morocco. Uh, but, but it also means, uh, 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 um, how should I say it? Uh, it, it? Like my father grew up in a village, for example, and, and let's say there was a dispute over a divorce and they couldn't agree. So they go to the rabbi and the rabbi, he says, I can't, I don't know what the, the Jewish law is on this uh, exactly. I, I'll have to send to the rabbi in Vilna. So he sends to the rabbi in Vilna. In other words, there's an authority figure within the religion that, 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 you know, that the buck stops there, the chief rabbinical someplace. And, and so there, it's a school of Judaism that's called Sephardic based on, on that was led by those Jews from, from that exiles from Spain that all kinds of Jews in, in most Arab countries adhered to. So they're Sephardic in the sense that they follow that teaching. Like Ashkenazi, it's not just the Jews in in Eastern Europe or in Germany, Jews in Norway would follow it too. It's a, so, there, it's, so Israel even has a Sephardic rabbi and Ashkenazi rabbi, but now they also have another term. They say Ashkenazi, Sephardi and, and, uh, and Mizrahi, which means Oriental. And, and, and that includes other communities like in Babylonia that, that it, according to all the documentations, there was a period where that was the only place there were Jews for, for a few years, uh, for, for a few generations. It's the oldest Jewish communities in Mesopotamia, but also the Jews of Uzbekistan, the Jews of Ethiopia, the Jews of, of you know, uh, that weren't beholden to, to either. You know, they were too far, they were removed. European and Sephardi Jews didn't even know those communities existed sometimes. Yemen, for instance. They barely knew anything about Yemen. So Yemenites were, were kind of a, and Yemen had a large Jewish community, uh, relatively large. Uh, so, so, so there's this third category that includes a bunch of groups. Actually, it's, it's several other categories. What you doing, Pop? But that's what Sephardic means. It, so it has, a, it has a two meanings, the Spanish Jews and, uh, and, uh, and the rabbinate that follows the Sephardic tradition. So when somebody says they're Sephardic, they're not Polish, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, Susan asked, uh, asked a question about your background, especially in your history interest. My, my educational background? What specifically, Susan? I was just curious. I, I wasn't here for the introduction, your introduction, Joe. So I was just curious about your interest in teaching this class on uh, Zionism and where all, you know, your information, is it all something you've just uh, learned on your own? Have you studied it? Um, it's just kind of okay. curious okay. where you come, okay. how you come to being so interested in the subject. Well, I, I, I when I was uh, four years old, right before I turned five, uh, my, my father was deported. And, and we went in exile and we went to Israel and I grew up over there and, and uh, uh, studied the, the, the curriculum, which included mandatory Bible studies and, and a lot of Zionism because they were trying to form a country, like I was saying. So I studied all that and, and uh, I couldn't go back because had I been drafted into the Israeli army, I would have lost my American citizenship. And, and because my mother's not Jewish, I wouldn't be considered Jewish would make things very difficult in a, in a country that's very theocratic. I, for instance, I couldn't marry a Jewish woman in Israel and, and you know, cause a Jew can't marry a Christian in Israel. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, 
so I left because I would have lost my American citizenship and my parents wanted me to come back and get an education. So, so, but after 23 years, I was able to go back. I've, I have one sister that still lives there. I've been back 12 times. Uh, I've, I've kept informed in the media. I've read a lot of history about it, studied it, and I've been, you know, active in the peace movement. Thank you. Um, Jumana, Jumana, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, has a question. Why is it difficult for Zionist Jews to assimilate with other cultures? I'm not sure that it's necessarily difficult, but, but uh, I mean, the Zionist Jews that think of themselves as Zionists assimilate very well in the United States, for instance. Not all of them, but, but the overwhelming majority have assimilated unbelievably. But if you're a real hardcore nationalist, uh, Jewish nationalist, and you consider yourself a Jew more than a Frenchman, uh, it's hard. I mean, people won't necessarily trust you, you know, I mean, uh, if you know, but if you're an American Jew that thinks of yourself as a Zionist because you support the Jewish state in Israel, but think of yourself as a patriotic American and 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 do fulfill all the obligations of a patriotic American, then you you don't really have any problems here that I know of. Uh, it's not an issue. It's a matter of fact. Uh, 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 I think most non-Jews uh, in America kind of think that's cool, you know. Not that they necessarily should, but but that's the way it's been. I mean, I mean, the 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 problem, of course, is that Israel has become more and more aggressive, right? And 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 expansionist and aggressive, and 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 uh, you know, uh, uh, like like uh, Noam Noam uh, Chomsky, he said, I used to have to have bodyguards when I went to campus. Now nobody disagrees with me. In other words, there's been a a, a lot of feeling that that Israel's in the wrong, that people support a solution to a peace solution in Palestine, you know, with the Palestinians and the Israel, Israelis and, 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 and all that. So, so if you're hardcore and you, you know, and you're, you're not willing to compromise and everything, you might have a hard time fitting in in a lot of countries, but, but uh, you would have a hard time in the Arab countries uh, because some of them are, are um, some of them you wouldn't have any trouble with, like Morocco, but some of them you would have problems in because it depends on the nature of the state, right? Uh, some, some, uh, you know, uh, it, yeah, it depends on the nature of the particular uh, country. But, but I think overall Jews have uh, assimilating quite well. As a matter of fact, uh, the 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 Jewish community in America is really worried about it because there's there's so much intermarriage. Yeah, I I would say there's, it depends on the culture, like Saudi Arabia, you're not even going to be able to get a visa to enter if you're Jewish. Um, but uh, in the United States, where the Republic Par Republican Party is 100% um, behind Israel, no matter what they do, um, you would fit in well if you were a Zionist, I would think. And uh, it, the it all depends. The, the, every administration we've had has been 100% for Israel. Obama administration, uh, Biden administration, uh, uh, Clinton administration. I mean, I mean, when when Secretary of State Kerry went over to to do negotiations, to to try to stimulate negotiations, he knew that Netanyahu would not never negotiate. It was a it was a fake thing, you know. I mean. I mean, the, the American position has been pro-Israel. In Europe, the majority of people in Western Europe, maybe in Europe generally, do not, no longer sympathize with the Israeli position. I'm talking about the Israeli position vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. I'm not talking about a Jewish state so much, but they're, they, they sympathize with the Palestinians. In America, it was like that. It was 90, 95% that supported Israel, and now about a third of the Americans no longer do they have a lot of sympathy especially younger people uh college campuses and stuff and 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 it's going to keep eroding if israel pursues these these uh you know trump kushner policies they you know that that you know they're, they'll israel will lose more and more support by the way saudi arabia and saudi arabia it's against the law to pray if you're not a muslim like an american businessman 
visiting Saudi Arabia, it's against the law for, for American businessmen to pray silently alone in a room, not that they could enforce it, but it's, even that is against the Saudi law. But Kushner was welcome there. And he's an Orthodox Jew. <laughs> he has but, money. But, I think that's the... <laughs> that's the uh, right, but he was representing the American that government. He passed. <laughs> But he was also representing the American government. But 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 you know, Saudi Arabia is not an example of enlightenment or or anything, right? I mean, even, I mean, they, uh, they, they don't make they, pretenses of of being democratic or anything. Even though they chaired the Human Rights Council at the UN. Yeah, well, they got to take turns, anyways. Uh, Jumana has another question. Do you consider Netanyahu a, a Zionist Jew? Well, of course. I mean, I mean, anybody that says they're a Zionist, I would, I would say, yeah. I mean, he, he definitely is, you know, I mean, he's, he fits it on anybody. All, all six definitions I gave at the beginning, they, he fits uh, pretty much all of them. I mean, he, 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 he is a Zionist. Uh, uh, he was raised a Zionist by his father. Uh, and he's a Zionist. I mean, I mean, part of the Zionists of, of people like him, of, of all political parties in Israel, the Labour Party and, I mean, the, the, the governments, the ones that have ruled the governments, Ben-Gurion back in his day and, and, and uh, Eshkol and, and uh, uh, what's her name, Amir, uh, Golda Meir and all those, they, they don't, not, they're not only Zionists, they, they think that, that it's wrong for any Jewish person not to live there that they believe all Jews should live there. And I'm sure that's Netanyahu's position, at least his express position. Uh, I mean, he, he probably hopes that some of them that are making a lot of money and donating stay where they are and make money and donate, but but their, their public opinion is that all Jews belong there, preferably on, on confiscated Palestinian land. But that's Netanyahu's position. Not only that, yeah, he's a Zionist, but he's also an expansionist. I mean, he had a he had a man in his cabinet that that ran for office on the on the position that that the Israeli army should expel all Palestinians from the West Bank, all two million of them, push them across the Jordan River. And he was a cabinet, he was on his cabinet. He put him on the cabinet. Wow. And he, he died since then, but 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 there's people in his cabinet, in his alliance that take these kinds of positions, you know. Uh, uh, you know, like I, I was just reading some stuff about this rabbi on the West Bank that said that 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 God intended the Palestinians to be slaves of the Jews. But there's also rabbis and Hasidic sects that don't recognize the state of Israel because they're waiting for the Messiah. And Yasser Arafat in the, in the Palestinian Authority had one of them as a minister of religions. It's, it's you know, so there, there's contradictions all over the place, you know, that kind of thing. It's not a, a fixed thing, but the, the ruling political parties are right now are very right wing and very, uh, uh, you know, you know. I mean, I mean, think of Israel. Let let give you an example. The occupied West Bank. There's a whole bunch of Jewish settlers there that are about a half a million people. Many of them are are not really ideological so much as they got cheap housing, and it's on the border, and they can commute to work in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, so they got a real good deal. And, and some of them are even hoping that there's a two-state solution and they, because then they'd get bought out and they'd make a lot of money because same thing happened in the Sinai when, the, when there was a, a few hundred settlers and when Israel withdrew from the Sinai, they bought out these settlers and they gave them like several times what they had paid for their houses. So, but I mean, but a lot of them are just hardcore. All those half million people can vote in Israeli elections. Now, 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 within Israel proper, what I'd call the pre-67 borders, there's there's 21% of the people are, are, are Arab people, and and they're they're citizens, legally at least they're citizens, and, and they can vote in Israeli elections, but an Arab living in the West Bank 
cannot cannot vote, and if they're not Israeli citizens, they cannot vote, but a Jew can. And an Israeli citizen who who lives in Tucson cannot vote in Israeli elections. They have to go back to Israel to vote. They can't vote unless you're a diplomat. You have to go back there to vote. But if you're a settler in the West Bank, you can vote. But if you're an Arab in the West Bank, you can't. And so you don't have to. You don't have to return back within the 1967 borders in no, order to no, vote. No, no, no. You walk down to the blo the block to the voting place and you vote. And and because that's Israel, it's historically Israel. See, that's the claim. It's Judea, it's Samaria. Even though Samaria, northern Israel, was never Jew Judea, <laughs> it was where the ten tribes lived. The Jews are allegedly the descendants of, of 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 you know of Judah, not the descendants of the all the Israelites. It it, it doesn't matter because God in the Bible promised these areas to Abraham's descendants, so it's theirs. <laughs> And, because and, book <laughs> and and you see the I, I was reading one book when i was preparing for this I, I went to the library and i got about 10 books and the next day i took about seven eight of them back because they were terrible but but one of the book that went into it said said described it as two israels there's a israel proper where where it's somewhat democratic and everything and 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 everybody gets to vote and everything although it's still a Jewish state and the national anthem is for Jews only. Yeah. But and then there's this other Israel on the West Bank that's apartheid state, apartheid. I should I should pronounce it correctly. Uh, apart a South African told me once it's pronounced like apart and hate, apartheid. And and not no pun intended, that's the correct pronunciation. So it's like an apartheid state, yeah. And and uh so there's really like two Israels. Uh you know, and, and Gaza is something else altogether. Gaza is like a big prison where people can't come and go or anything. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, and, and what, you know, a, a lot of people that, you know, young intellectuals, you know, young intellectuals that have education that, 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 you know, uh, a lot of them emigrate, a lot of them just leave. And and they and I, I see their posts and they say, you got to have a, a citizenship of another country. You got to get a French citizenship or Spanish citizenship or Italian citizenship. You got to American citizenship. You got to get another citizenship because this country is getting so bad. You want to be able to leave and you want to be able to, uh, you know. And 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 one of the people, if you're if you're interested in a character, his name is is Avram Berg, and and Mr. Berg, his father was. Uh, one of the founders of, of the state, he, he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and 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 he was with the leader of the. When I was a kid, he was a leader of the National Religious Party, that's now one of the settler parties, and and uh, right right wing party. Back then, it was it was religious, but not super orthodox. And and his son uh, went to college, and he got involved in in the peace movement, and he was actually. I think he was wounded, but he was at a demonstration. My sister was at the demonstration where, where one of the kids was killed and several were wounded by the police. I mean, they, they shot him up and, and, and everything. So he was a protester. Later, he joined the Labor Party. He became speaker of the parliament. He was pr president pro tem of Israel, president. And, and, and uh, he was later head of the Jewish agency, which is the Zionist thing that builds support for Israel internationally among, among you know, and, and about four years ago or so, he, he, he wears a yarmulke, although he's, you know, like a, a religious Jew, and, and he drove on Sabbath to Nazareth to, and joined the communist uh, 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 alliance because he, he says it's post-Zionism. It has to be the country for everybody that lives there, hmm. you know. It can't be a country for Jews only. I mean, there's other people that live here, and it's, and it's, it, it's, it's, you know, it's. So he he just, he just got fed up, and and uh, and I in the last election, about twenty thirty thousand. Uh, 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 what what happened is that one of the right wing parties, there were four four Arab parties in Israel, 
uh, one was an Islamic party, one was an Arab nationalist party, one is kind of ultra leftish, uh, and one is and one is is led by the Communist Party. Uh, you know, so one is kind of more Maoist, kind of uh, you know further, and 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 they they. And, and one is a communist and, and they changed the law that the threshold for getting seats in the parliament was three and a half percent. And they were worried that some of these parties wouldn't be able to make that threshold. So they united on one list. And, and this last election last year, I think uh, 20, 30,000 uh, uh, progressive Jews went, young people went, when I'm saying young, I'm 74 years old. So everybody's young nowadays, but I mean, people in their thirties, forties, uh, uh, went over and voted with that alliance with the Arab parties because they're just sick and tired of the racism and and everything. You know the the you know the the gov the school system is government run, and you and and the cities get government money from the from the national government and the school system gets. But anybody can set up a school, and it could be a religious school, any any sect, any Jewish sect, any Muslim sect, any they can set up a school, and as long as they teach some core subjects like math and science and whatever they, they can get funding, but the, the Arab area schools get a, a third or a fourth of the funding of the Jewish schools. The municipalities get a third of the money the Jewish municipalities get. It, it, the discrimination is rampant. And I remember saying that to one of my early visits, uh, uh, I met one of the men who we were the same age and we played together. He used to live across the street from me when I was a kid. So I was visiting with him and I mentioned that and he denied it. I'd read it in the paper that morning. It's official statistics of the government. Uh, uh, you know, he, he just denies it. So they, they, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. It's weird, you know, he doesn't even come up with an excuse. Well. Wow. Um, there are two other questions I see here. Um, Jumana has another one. Do you agree that so much anti-Semitic sentiment is to encourage Jews to move to Israel? Hmm. I mean, like I said, there, there was that, there was periods where that happened. Uh, I, you know, some of the Nazis and the anti-Semites are right wing kind of the guys that, that participated in that insurgency on, on you know some of those right wing mobs they they might they might want to drive Jews out but that's not why they're anti semitic they they want the Jews to leave because they're already anti semitic uh, so there might be some of that but i i think it's demagoguery mostly and ignorance and it's it's a kind of racism it's like saying does does anti-black racism in this country because they want people to go to Africa or do they want people to go to black people to go to Africa because they're racist already? Who knows? You know, there might be some of it. I, I, I just think it's the leftovers from, you know, up until the first, second world war, Jews were ghettoized in this country. Jews could not, I'm from Minneapolis and in Minneapolis, uh, I mean, I've been here 40 years in Tucson, but I'm, I'm from Minneapolis and in Minneapolis, Jews were only allowed to live in in very fixed areas until the Second World War. And it's only when Hubert Humphrey was mayor in the late forties that they passed anti-discrimination laws and Jews were able to move out. There's actually a book somebody gave me is about how Jews are white people now, but, the, but the, it wasn't like that before the, the, the Second World War. Before the, white, before the First World War, the scientists were writing about how Jews were intellectually, mentally inferior because they, they scored worse on all Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans scored worse on, on IQ type tests and stuff because they were immigrants and they didn't have good English. So Jews were inferior and, and, and that changed in the, in the 30s uh, to maybe Jews are real cunning and smart, but, but, uh, but also anti-Semitic and, 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 but it all changed after the war. Uh, uh, you know what? What also changed is that during the, during what what happened in the after the Second World War in the early '40s, people were scared. Jewish people were scared about what happened to you. You know, a third of all the Jews in the world were killed, murdered. So they were scared, and and uh, and and for Israel, and they. I mean, of course, Israel was not really threatened uh, uh, when they fought those wars in '67 and and stuff. The 
the, the Israel had more soldiers in uniform than all the Arab countries combined that, that they fought against. And they were no, they were, they were not in dis, any disadvantage, but, but they were scared for Israel and they, uh, and, you know, but, but today's Jews are the, the generation that's growing up now, they're, that's evaporated. They, they don't feel anti-Semitism. They, they see Israel as a very strong power. It's not threatened. You know, they might sympathize with Israel, but they're not threatened. Uh, they don't feel threatened. So, so the whole, I, I think things have changed, aside from the politics in Israel itself, to the extent that Americans are aware of it. Okay, thanks. Um, and Howard has a question. Uh, the Oslo Accords are cited as an example of Palestinian intransigence, yet a CNN documentary a year ago detailed that the Oslo Accords only offered 3% of the land uh, that the Palestinians were negotiating for. Um, do I don't think three percent would be correct, but but no, the the, the main it, it's Israel. That's a, you know Israel says that that before you do anything, the Palestinian people have to recognize the state of Israel. Well, when they agree to negotiate with them, they're recognizing the state. Uh, you know, but 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 it, that the Palestinians are not giving anything up. Well. If you're a Palestinian that that was born in in Yafo, which is part of Tel Aviv, Jaffa, and and you go negotiate and you're willing to renounce your claims to the home you left behind, you were chased out of, and and the city and everything, you are giving something up. I mean, they're they're relinquishing the most of the country if they negotiate two states. So to say that they're not giving anything up because, you know, it, 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 it is not false. It's like it's like the bully and the in the schoolyard that takes your lunch money and 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 the teacher says, well, you, you gotta negotiate, but you're not gonna give his money back, but he'll stop hitting you. Th that's not a deal. That's not fair negotiations. He's not even offering to give you half of it back. So the 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 issues are uh the issues are uh uh two states or one state or or a binational state. The binational state's probably not a great idea. Examples of that, like Cyprus, the, usually don't work if there's strong nationalism. But a but a two state a two state solution or one democratic secular state, right? Divide no religion involved in the state, freedom of religion, uh, democratic state where everybody has the same rights. The Palestinian people generally support that, but but in Israel, only twenty people in the whole country. I mean, Israelis don't support that. They want a Jewish state. So I, 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 I this, I'm quoting, I'm paraphrasing the Palestinian ambassador to the UN. He was in Tucson once and sat in the backyard and I listened to him and he said, okay, so we'll compromise on a Palestinian state. So that's what the negotiations, if, if there's a Palestinian state, the stumbling box are where the border will be, right? And, and, and secondly, uh, do the Palestinian people have the right to return to, to their homes? And number three, uh, uh, Jerusalem, what happens to Jerusalem? And, 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 you know, the, the, obviously the, there, there probably will never be, uh, 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 the, on a two state solution, there wouldn't be a right for the Palestinians to return, but, but they might have reached an agreement that 20,000 could return or 50,000 or 100,000 or a certain number would be allowed to return. And, and that could happen. And, and the borders, of course, have to be worked out. But there are solutions that, that uh, Israel might keep part of the West Bank and then return, uh, turn over parts of what was Israel, especially parts that have Arab population or, or whatever. Uh, you know, those things might be able to be worked out. And Jerusalem, that's a little tougher because the holy places to, to, to Christians, the, the, the Arabs, are, are mostly Muslims, but there's a lot of Christians and Druze in other denominations, and 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 they're holy places, you know, Jerusalem and and uh, and you know, but but you know, you could set up a you could set up a thing where where parts of Jerusalem or all of Jerusalem could be could overlap and it could belong to both countries, <clears throat> and people that live there could pick a citizenship of one or the other. There's all kinds of solutions you could make if you're really interested in peace. And 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 I think that the I think that there was the Israeli side that that 
you know, that's not willing to compromise on, on any of these things, really. Uh, certainly the Netanyahu government isn't. Uh, so far, the Israeli government, I, I remember reading something that Yasser Arafat, for those younger people, uh, Arafat was the leader of the Palestinian people uh, until 10, 15 years ago, wherever, whenever he died for a long period. And, and he said in the 70s that the only stumbling block is Jerusalem. But that was before there was a lot of settlement in the West Bank. Uh, you know, so, so, I mean, Netanyahu could never agree to it because, you know, because those people in the West Bank wouldn't support him. And he, he, can't, he can't win an election without that half a million people, settlers. You know, there was I this mean, uh, Supreme Court decision in Israel uh, that, um, or or maybe it was legislation. I uh, I'm vague on the details, but that reaffirmed the that Israel is a Jewish state, which I mean it always was. I didn't quite understand the implications of that. I don't know if you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, yeah, it it's a big point of contention. Israel was a a Jewish state, but it was also recognized as binational. Uh, I mean, the Zionist movement originally was calling for a Jewish homeland because they didn't expect huge immigration in. They just wanted a place where Jews could live and, and have a Jewish community. Uh, but of course, now that they're a majority, so, so, but they wanted to, to, to enforce it. I think they just passed a law that Arabic is no longer an uh, yeah, uh, part of it. official language. I mean, <laughs> Arabic was always an official language. It was Hebrew, Arabic, and English. And 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 they made it just Hebrew. So they're 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 basically these right wing parties in return for being part of the government. They're they they insist on another anti Arab thing to to take away something. It's it's the same thing with the see Israel's system is they have 120 members of parliament. If you get a third of the vote, you get 40 of the 120. If you get 10 percent of the vote, you get 12 of 120. Each party gets exact proportion. So. There's, there's two big religious parties that each have seven, eight members in the parliament. And then the other, other party I mentioned earlier that's smaller. And these religious parties have been part of the coalition because no party gets a majority. So they have to form a coalition. They've been part of every coalition since 1948. And whenever they became a part of the coalition, they insist on, a, on, a, on something like, like no bus service on the Sabbath. So Israelis go to school. When I was a kid, we went to school six days a week. My father worked in a factory. He worked six days a week. The day off, fortunately, we lived in the Haifa area, which was the only part of Israel with, where the buses did run. But in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, the buses didn't run. So you couldn't go to the beach to, on your day off. You couldn't get a beach. Nobody owned cars. It was third world. And, and so they get that, or they outlaw pork, or they you know, some religious concession to these religious parties and becomes more and more theocratic every time they form a new government because they, they don't reverse those laws. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and some of the Arab parties are like the religious Islamic party just broke that unity government because they, 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 they like Netanyahu's position against gay marriage and, and gay rights and stuff. You know, the, 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 you know, the Islamic fundamentalist, uh, you know, so they're, you know, and that's something, I mean, Netanyahu doesn't care. Netanyahu is a politician. Politicians, you know, you read about the values of these pol politicians don't have any values, right? <laughs> just like ours. They, they'll, they'll go wherever, I mean, the overwhelming majority will just do whatever they have to. Uh, even if they have values, they'll sell them out. And, and, you know, so it's, it's a concession to the religious parties in coalition, because if he doesn't, uh, you know, uh, like the like the Orthodox Jews, uh, the the Haredim, which is some place between fifteen and twenty percent of the pop Jewish population, the, their sons don't. The, the women, if they're religious, don't have to go. Don't get drafted. Other women get. My two sisters, twin sisters, are younger than me. They both got drafted. The 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 but the boys. They, 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 they study the Torah, they study the Bible. If they're seminary, they don't get drafted. And, and according to the Jewish religion, you need a, a, a mass of young men studying the Bible or the world will fall apart, the universe. 
and and that's what holds the universe together is all these young men praying and and so so they passed so the the secular people are real pissed off about that that they get drafted and so they pass laws that they have to draft them and the, and the government just won't enforce it they make you know i mean the, the, the that's another reason a lot of young jewish people immigrate because they the, because of the religious uh, uh imposition on mm -hmm. them. Did, did a couple of other people have questions? Um, Susan and Elisa, you had your hands up. I I was just going to comment on a few things uh, that Joe said, and I you know uh, when somebody asked about the history of anti-Semitism, and in my opinion, it, it goes back to Constantine. So I I really think that's where it all started, and you know what, and it morphed from there, depending upon the politics of the of the region. And there were times when Jews were more accepted than not. But in the whole, if you take a look at that era from then on, there was this, always this uh, friction between Jews and Christians. Um, so, I mean, and I think it plays out today. So it has a very long standing, deep ideological basis. Um, and I, I believe it's also inherent in people's uh, growing up and how they're taught, you know, in the same way that uh, racism is. And you know, not the same, but similar. So that's, that's my opinion to that. And I guess the other piece about the idea of um, the, the Jewish state, the you know, the the trouble there. And again, that's this is my opinion that the original settlers were mostly agricultural, and a lot of them came from uh, both socialist and communist ideologies. You know, so originally they were a they didn't have a religion they were a religious and uh, the, some of the but still a religious and they originally settled started what was to be a more of a secular democracy uh, modeled like uh, that and that's changed a lot because and i would agree with joe because of the influence of the far right and of the religious community um but then again it, it, uh, in addition to power and all of the other uh I guess, um, uh, capitalistic ideologies and uh, people's desire to make money and get ahead. The, um, uh, the current environment in uh, Israel has moved more and more to the right and become less and less um, uh, the kind of place where, most, where a lot of modern Jews even want to live and lots of discrimination uh, as well. I don't know, Joe, I mean, if you're a Ethiopian Jew, or if you're a, uh, a Arabic Jew, I mean, and you're a Jewish citizen, with those reasons, even with the right of return, I don't think that those Jews are treated well either. And so, I think it's a very complicated problem. Yeah. Well, let, let me let me address that. Let me address that, Susan. Uh, uh, the, at the time of Constantine, of course. It, it, of course, the concept of anti-Semitism didn't exist. Uh, the words anti-Semitism didn't exist. Uh, it, it, the kingdom, the, the Jews and the Christians were all Greeks, or they were all Spanish. They were, they weren't, they didn't, you know what I mean? They were, they were converts, or their grandparents were converts. So it was anti, yeah, there was anti-Semitism, but it was against the Jewish religion as being non-Christian. It wasn't, it wasn't assumed that the Jews were, were a nationality. After all, uh, right. Apostle Paul himself was Jewish, right? Uh, right. So, so yeah, there was anti-Jewish religion. I mean, the Maccabees, uh, the Greek kings, you know, suppressing the Jewish religion and, and you know, the holiday of Hanukkah, you know, the, there, there was anti-Jewish religion stuff forever. There was anti-Christian stuff, right? They threw Christians to the lions. I mean, for sure, there was always anti-Jewish things, but that's different than, than modern anti-Semitism that's based on these racial, racial theories. But, and as far as the early settlers, yeah, I did say that the early Zionist movement came from the left. It was mostly left-wing groups, uh, small groups of Russian Jews. You know, there's, there's these books that are written about the, the Russian Jews that, that one son, one of the sons and daughters, I don't remember, it was sons and daughters. One was a Zionist, one was a Russian nationalist and one was a communist, you know, and, and, and one went to Israel, you know. So yeah, they, they, were, they were not religious, but however, they they may often atheistic, but they accepted the biblical they they accepted the the, the biblical uh, 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 notion that that they were descendant from the Israelites in the Bible, 
Hmm. So I'm saying it's based on that on that biblical story, not that they were religious and believed the Bible or the creation story, but they they accepted some parts of the Bible, as do I, as historical truth, and some parts as mythology. But it it was they never questioned it. Nobody questioned it. Nobody really questioned it because they didn't have other theories. That was the belief in the in all of Europe that that the Jews are descendants of the Israelites. There was an alternative text. Uh, uh, yeah, so only that part is, as I'm saying, was based on the Bible. Not, it wasn't based on religion. It was based on biblical uh, uh, narrative. Anybody else? I think we're kind of coming to an. Alyssa, did Alyssa have a question? You're muted. <laughs> yeah. Alyssa is a friend of mine. She's a she's a Sephardi Jew from her family came from Turkey. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as um, the other. I'm, I'm so used to saying the other Jews. My father would say the others. You were the others. We were the Sephardics. And um, the food is completely different. Um, children could be named for alive people, people who are living. The way they treat women is quite different. I think the Sephardics are more, um, they don't think very much of women. I mean, this is when I was growing up. I had to take stenography in high school, which I almost failed. Uh, because I wasn't going to go to college because I was going to get married anyway. So I fooled them. I didn't get married till I was 37. And I went to college. And um, it's just, it's just, I grew up so differently from the other, other Jewish children. And to this day, I, I can't eat, I can't eat, um, Jewish type of cooking because it was ingrained in me that it was not worth eating. Mm -hmm. You felt the fish is pretty weird. I don't eat that. <laughs> I don't eat that. Even if I wanted to eat it, just something said, you're not going to like it. it it's going to make you vomit. You're not going to like it. It was just, I mean, now I just realized because um, my sister and I were the first um, daughters to marry, um, my father would say, out of the religion. We, we didn't marry Sephardics. And um, I'm not going to even go into that. <laughs> but it's And I wish I knew more about Sephardic Jews because I, just, I read a lot and I know that my family came from Turkey, but yet they spoke Spanish. My, grand, my other part of the family came from Greece, but they were under Turkish rule and they spoke Spanish. And none of them spoke Hebrew. I I'd also like to go back to. Are you done, Alyssa? Yeah, yeah. I'm to finished. what Susan was saying about within Israel discrimination against some groups. It, it's 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 still rampant, especially the Ethiopians suffer a lot of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a more recent immigration, but it, the, the discrimination is is really. Uh, European and non-European. The European Jews were were mostly not allowed to own land. The European Jews were were farmers. I mean, were city people, and city people send their their children, especially their sons. Traditionally, they wanted to get educated. Farmers want the boys to work on the farm, and and the Jews from Morocco a lot of times were peasants. They were illiterate. 
uh, uh, so it, it compounded the, the racism. The, in growing up, the Hungarian Jews were worse because the Hungarian Jews had, had, had gone to uh, uh, fascist Nazi kind of schools in Hungary between the two wars and they believed that some groups were superior to others. They actually believed that. And, and uh, so there, there was a lot of racism uh, against dark-skinned Jews. The Yemenites were the, were the real dark-skinned then and the Yemenites especially. But the, the state of Israel, the Zionist movements wanted unity. And I remember they would give a, a couple that got married, like an Iraqi Jew and a, a, a Polish Jew got married. There was a money prize. They'd give them money if they got married, a mixed marriage. They were trying to get the Jews to intermarry. And, 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 and uh, 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 my, my niece in Israel is, is married to a... Is Kenazi, she's married to a Kurdish guy, and my my one of my sisters married a Yemenite, and they live in America. But but the the next generation, it's 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 there's a lot of intermarriage and everything, uh, uh, you know. So that they're getting assimilated, that part's getting assimilated. But still, still in at the Haifa University, uh, a Jew from uh, from a non-European country, or their parents or grandparents came from a non-European country is less likely to go to university than an Arab. And there's immense uh, discrimination against Arab students. So, so uh, you know, there's still a lot of cultural and social discrimination. And I would, I would remember kids occasionally would make these real racist statements against, you know, Schwarze, meaning black, uh, to, to non, about non, uh, you know, my, my, my father had, a, had a, a woman in the neighborhood uh, uh, come to him and, and ask him for advice. He's an educated man, so they, she came to him for advice. A Polish, a Polish Jew, and and he says, "What's the problem? My son wants to marry a Schwarza, an Algerian woman. What should I do?" He kicked her out. He said, "Didn't you learn anything from Hitler?" You know, but 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 the 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 bride was not accepted until she had children, and then everything was fine when they had grandkids. But but that changes. That's similar to. To you know, it, it's probably you know that's changing, but definitely that's built into Israeli culture, and especially, like I said, the 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 European. I mean, Israelis have the European kind of racism, not the American kind of racism. It's a little different, uh, uh, and and but it it's yeah, it, 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 Israeli society is full of that kind of racism. Uh, uh, I had visitors here. My my brother-in-law, my Yemenite brother-in-law, his older brothers came to visit. And, and, and they were people that were born like in 1940. So, and, and very poorly educated. And they, and he's saying, he was very curious. I took him around Arizona and he was curious about native, the Native American people. And he said, what are they like? He was expecting me to have some characteristics. And I said, uh, you know, they're real lazy and they're real hardworking. They're real stupid, but they're real smart. They're real this and they're real, just like Jews. <laughs> you know, they, they don't get it. They, they're taught, that it's that whole European racism that think nationalities are, are all past the, you know, they're all descendants of one couple and they all have characteristics that are, you know, it, it's, it's this 19th century racism that still exists, especially with people that are not educated. Uh, uh, yeah, Israel's full of that. But, but but and then the Russian Jews. There's a million Russians that came, that that are that also have a lot of uh, uh, racist kind of European racist kind of attitudes. So so that kind of enforced some of that. But there are, the Russians at least are very anti-religious and they're against the 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 religious laws. You know, Israel's very. You know, now they have a lot of African immigrants, you know, not Jews, just people that come there to work uh, uh, undocumented, you know, that Tel Aviv is full of all kinds of people. And then they bring in, uh, uh, you know, in Israel, if you if you're if you're older and your mother, need, if you're, you have an older mother that needs somebody to look after her to move in a, a, a domestic care worker, they don't say get a domestic care worker. They say get a Filipina. Why don't you get a Filipina? You know, I mean, it's 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 full of the stereotypes and everything. I mean, here we have a lot of racism, but it's not respectable. There, it's not so unrespectable.
Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Jumana had a couple of clarifications about uh, their questions. Um, they they wanted to ask about the anti-Semitism driving Jews to move to Israel um, in the sense of asking about our Zionists amplifying anti-Semitic sentiment for the purpose of driving more Jews to move to Israel, similar to the Ben-Gurion doctrine. Um, I'm, I don't recall if you had yeah, I, on that I, or not. It's, it's not clear to me. It's not clear. I mean, there might be some. It's not effective. I mean, it's not driving masses of people or anything. Americans don't. I mean, you know, I had a cousin that moved to Israel. Uh, maybe one of the reasons we ended up there is because my father's favorite niece was living there uh, uh, with her husband and, and, and she lasted five years. I mean, until recently, you had to be pretty, pretty extreme Zionist to, to give up American uh, a lifestyle and, and wealth and everything to, to move to a poorer country. But Israel's getting wealthier. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, we lived, we lived in a, a 400 square foot, 400 feet house, a family of six. Uh, we had a, a, a half a kilo, about a pound of of meat once a week, one chicken a month, a half an egg a person a day. Uh, not that they gave you a half an egg, but they, six people in the family, they gave you three eggs. I mean, it, everything was rationed. It was, uh, when I left Israel in 1962, I'd only known two people that owned a car and they were both doctors that made house calls. So they were allowed to get a car. Nobody owned automobiles. Uh, I mean, it was a very poor country. Now it's not so poor anymore, but it's not as wealthy as the United States. It's it's not easy to live there. Uh, so th there are not a lot of the Americans that go there are are often uh, uh, either they're just you know uh, you know there there may be people that that aren't competent to support themselves and everything, and they have a they have a safety net. They'll give you some money. They'll they'll you know what I mean. They you won't be homeless there. So they some people go for that reason, and then some people go because they're they're strong Zionist, nationalist, religious, uh, religious reasons, that kind of thing. But but I don't think it's succeeding. I mean, the, the American Jews are not leaving en masse. As a matter of fact, there's pro I'm sure there's more Israeli Jews moving to the United States another way. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm I'm sure. Okay. All right, um, and Howard just posted a couple of comments and recommendations. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna ask those as questions, but anyone who's interested, please take a look at the chat. Uh, if you like Matzo or documentaries. Um, are there any more questions from anyone? I, I have a question. Uh, sorry, I'll put my hand up here. Uh, just go ahead. So, um, yeah, I just I joined late, and uh, so I just was here for the last hour, the Q and A, and I enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed it. So, I'm just curious about future talks you might give and so forth. Well, <laughs> I was I was telling him that I that that one of my lefty friends, you know, asked me once, uh, he happens to be Mexican American and he didn't know much about Zionism and he hears talk about it. So he, he says, why well, I'm at Salt of the Earth Labor College. I'm, I'm co-director at Salt of the Earth Labor College. We do classes and, and lectures and stuff. And he said, we should do something about Zionism. I don't, I don't know. I don't understand it. Could somebody do it? So I said, I'm, per, I'm the person to do it. So, so that's why I prepared. And, and I'm, I'm, I was going over the same notes that I used then it's about three years ago, but this is the fourth time I've done that. So that's that's my contribution. Uh, uh, you know, I don't have any plans. I might do something else, but but I haven't. But I, I'll be happy if I'll I'll be happy to do this presentation any place, anytime. Uh, uh, if so, you know, if you get four or five people together, you know, I'll be happy to do it. And when the pandemic's over, uh, if I have me over for coffee, if you have a, a small group, even. Uh, I think it's important to educate people. Thanks, Joe. And um, anyone interested in Freethought Arizona's events, um, you can visit our website at freethought-az.org uh, or our meetup page. Uh, it's meetup.com slash freethoughtaz. 
or our YouTube, which is FreeThoughtAZ, or uh, we're on Facebook as well as FreeThought Arizona. And our events get posted on uh, on the Facebook page and our meetup page. And next month we have Representative uh, Andres Cano to speak to us for our March monthly presentation. That's on the 14th. I voted for him. So come join us, Joe. <laughs>